Sarich of Ngāpuhi and Te Rarawa descent is a leading Māori educator in the far north, working with young and old alike to create inclusive spaces for exploring ngā taonga tākaro and taonga puoro. He chats with Horomono Horo about his playful work, a result of his carefree childhood growing up in South Auckland and connection to Te Ao Māori through his whānau. No, my Tēnā tātou katoa, e te tī, e te tā, nau mai hoki mai rā ki tēnei o ngā whiti-whiti ngā kōrero o te whānau o haumanu a, i roto i tēnei kaupapa. Kia koutou katoa o te whānau haumanu, tēnei au e karanga nei, tēnei au e kōrero nei, arā te reo o horomono horo e mihi kauatuana ki ngā hauwewha. Kia koutou e te tī, e karanga ana i te hau o tā whirimātia, kia koutou e tā, e mauana i te hau o parawerenui a nei rā tātou te whānau o haumanu e mihi kauatuana a ki ngā hauwewha. Ki tēnei o ngā whiti-whiti ngā kōrero o haumanu i te pō nei, a tēnei au ka mihi ake a kia koutou katoa me tō tātou manuhiri i te pō nei, a tō tātou hoa i roto i te whānau o haumanu a tēnei au ka mihi ake a, ki aia, a tēnei o ngā mara, tēnei o ngā hoa, a tēnei o ngā tuakana o te taitoke rau, o te whānota, tēnei ka mihi ake ki tō tātou manuhiri i te pō nei, a tēnā koe te hoa e wirimu, nau mai haramai ki tēnei o ngā whiti-whiti kōrero o te whānau haumanu. Tēnā koe. Tēnā no, iwa tēnā no tātou kato e te whānau, a, e te whānau e te haumanu nei. Tēnei au, te tēnei haututu no hoki anga nei, hoki anga iho, hoki anga ake, ko hau mai i rutu i tēnei o ngā karanga. Uh, hine rako tauri mā, e te whakahuhu i a tātou, uh, i rutu i rutu tēnei kopapa whakahiri i tēnei. Ana, uh, uh, te, te ngā, ngā mana oro oro nei, uh, kia pā oro oro atu ki tēnā pito, ki tēnā pito, huri no, huri no te motu, huri no tā. Kia ora uru mai tātou. Te tēnā koe e hoa. Uh, Wiramu, bro, it's been many, many moons uh, since we've crossed pathways in Te Ao Māori, in Te Ao Puoro, in Te Ao Tākoro. It's just really an awesome buzz to be able to catch up with you in our Fiti Fiti Kōrero here and just to Kōrero and know about the Kōrero in and around Taonga Puoro. And so one of the biggest Kōrero that we've been having in this particular series is actually hearing and seeing how our whānau was in Haumanu around the Mōtu to and around the Ao, we're actually introduced to the world of Taonga Puro. And so before you get into that, uh, just to uh, let our whānau whānui know, uh, ko wai rā koe i ahu mai koe i hea. Uh, kia ora nga tātou. Ai, e e uri tēnei no, no hoki anga, uh, born and bred in the south side of Auckland. So you're pretty sharp. <laughs> you've got to show you grow up pretty sharp and pretty quick around those spaces. Very fortunate to have spent my um, my youth spread out amongst my whānau whānui be pretty ordinary for me every week to catch up with 30, 50, 100 cousins every weekend at our grandparents had uh, organised uh, social clubs so that we were playing rugby and, and netball and so we had weekly gatherings. So although born and bred in South Auckland, the Hokianga was pretty much and the runnings of in particular Motukaraka Marae, my Tupotoki Motukaraka, all of those learnings, all of them, you know, were nanonyms because they were movers and shakers in that space. So kind of my child Māori will view my lens came from just being raised in the wider family. And like I said, lucky enough to be able to bump with the whole family every week. And then, of course, get some pretty awesome leaders. Like I said, my grandmother in particular was a real go-getter back in her time and um, had the foresight to make sure that we were still connected with our marae and all the tikanga and aspects connected to that. My grandfather is a massive influence on me as well. He kind of helped the little hotu to boy. He, he had a... Uh, my dad was the ringa kaha. My papa was the ngākau mari. So you catch me and enlighten me to my creative side, my my spiritual inner spaces, more with my grandfather. My mother's uh, people, she's from Tainu and also from Waikato. And my mum's Spano, very musical, in particular the brothers Marsh. My auntie had five sons and they're all freak musicians. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I've got four sisters and I got raised mostly around girls. So any weekend, any holiday, I'd never get a chance to shoot out to Waikou. So I grew up out in Waikou, Pukekui, out in Afitu, out in Manukau. 
a lot of time. In fact, out there, they think my name is Wooly Marsh because of my time with my Marsh brothers. I can tell by what name people call me by what part of my lifetime we crossed paths. <laughs> In the last 10 years, I've been Wurimu because of my um, connection and commitment to Te Reo. Actually, it's Te Reo that really brought me on this journey and reconnected me with Tonga Pūru. And then, of course, just the amazing fruits that come from just engaging with our, any of our two-point knowledge systems, reconnecting in those spaces. So, um, like I said, kind of, or they brought up in the uh, dark side of town, so to speak, plenty of light shining in on there and lots of positive examples from Tao Māori to hold that. Um, I didn't grow up speaking te reo, but we understood it. We learned pretty quick, you know, when the nans and that are speaking in te reo. If you respond, then you get free access to the cakes in the kitchen. So, <laughs> And of course, because you've got access to that space, really in the kauta, I would could follow most of the kōruru happening in, in the marae or out on the tomato kōruru. But the bits you miss, obviously, in the kitchen, that's when it all gets derailed. And, of course, you get it all broken down again because, you know, they're speaking bilingually in there. And so the bits you might have missed inside the party, and the knock off it, catch it. At the, we had a proper car to do back when I was a kid, so it's actually around the fire. You know? So that was one of the mahi they have to do, go and click manuka and keep the fires burning and make sure everything's good to go in there. But in that space, like I said, you get the same conversation that happened in the Farinui happens out the back but you get all the different dynamics that come with it. You know, a certain nan or a certain papa that always gets growling all the time and <laughs> it's in the kitchen, it's in the car until you find out why why all those things happen. So we've kind of always been around the background to it, was never sort of given formal training to move into any space, but definitely exposed to it and absorbed, fortunate enough to be able to absorb all of those teachings, all of those learnings. And of course, like I said, just a normal ho to just like any kid. In my uh, uh, age bracket, all, all us brothers and sisters, we were pretty free-range chickens. We had pretty big territories to roam. We we're mostly based up in Flatbush, which is close to Manukau in Otarain. But we'd walk up to Otahu every day, the Hunter's Corner, and all those types of things. That's just there that was nothing to us. <laughs> they're covering those types of distances. And then, of course, I had whānau everywhere, so we're popping into different spaces and just yeah, be little ho and just enough eyes on us, and particularly with me, because my dad, like I said, he's a bit of the strong arm in the family. So anytime someone, any of the whanau caught me in spaces I'm not supposed to be, they, they give you that look. And <laughs> 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 Which just, of course, meant that I had to up my game on my hotel to make sure you never got caught. <laughs> but because of that nature, just really playful. Was good at lots of things, particularly with the cousins that we're all good at different sports. But my cousin Lance, in particular, massive influence within Puro, just period, just absolute freak bass player, just chasing him, kind of constantly, constantly in the shadow. Like he'd come up with new ideas and, and amazing compositions and <laughs> make mistakes that were just amazing. <laughs> and so, so I learned pretty quick that hang on, the mistakes aren't necessarily mistakes, they, they can lead to new ideas and things like that. So, kind of nurtured my um, creative spaces. And then, of course, having a big access to a wider family got lots of dynamics. So I'm spending a lot of time with different uncles and aunties and different age groups. I think that's been real important in terms of my current understanding because I got to hear conversations from different levels, whether it be political, musical, artistic, mergers of different games coming through the time. I mean, I'm in South Auckland at college before any of the sort of American style street games are coming into fruition. In fact, we thought they were all weird <laughs> when they first when the Bloods and Crypts and stuff like that come out. So yeah, like I said, just moving around really freely, exploring all the things I like, which always came down to play. In my last 10 years, I've been fortunate enough to be up here in the far north, working with Te Ranga Tararawa as a youth educator. And Taonga Tako has pretty much been my bread and butter for the last 10 years. And of course, Tonga Pūro sits naturally within those spaces with Whare Tāpuni and all those types of things. So I kind of was just able to bring all of that life experience into that play space, which I'm natural at. I kind of got that whole ADHD sort of thing going off, which just means, man, we, like most Māori boys like me, we just bounce off the walls here. (laughs) (laughs) You want to stop bouncing off the walls, you have to make the walls a little bit wider. (laughs) Just take take us outside so we've got some room to bounce around and um, we don't annoy as many people that way. 
So like I said, kind of high energy. I would never have thought I would end up in schools working the way I've been over the last 10 years. Like if you ask anyone from my schooling days, I never used to show up at school anyway. And then I found doing mahi with tākuru within kura and stuff like that. And basically haven't missed a day of school since, which is <laughs> the complete opposite to my experience within the education system as a kid. Kind of couldn't wait to get out of there, so I never expected to be back. But I love sharing things I've learned from child Māori and bringing them into those spaces. And Tāko is like a perfect, perfect fit for me. And I think it's a good way for me to share it uh, with the kids as well. And then, of course, multiple opportunities to mix and mingle all our different arts and crafts. And I think that's why I like Tonga Takoro too, because you can dabble in all the different arts. You know, you, you're going to need to know some weaving. You're going to need to know a little bit about the tie how those cycles work. You definitely learn about moods, the maramataka. I think for me, I've always had a natural affiliation with the maramataka in terms of how I move, because on the so-called low energy moons, like I don't have a lot of those. You know, I'm bouncing off the moon <laughs> every night. And it just so happens I bounce just a little bit less on some of the low energy moons. But put that energy of mine in front of someone who's chill and they think, dude, this dude just needs to calm down. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I I'd, um, intuitively kind of just figured out how things function for myself. I think that's what I've learned over the last 10 years anyway, moving through different spaces with different whanau, different kids, is just understanding. Like I definitely know on certain moons, like especially Kura, that I work with in uh, regular time frames. What works over on the East Coast in the morning is not going to work out on the West Coast when I get out to Pangaru and those kura out there in the afternoon and vice versa. The wind I get, the engagement I get during one space, it doesn't necessarily transfer over and you can actually just move over the manga. <laughs> Literally go to the kura over the manga, but you're in a whole different space and I think it's important to recognise that that's kind of how things are and then I think I'm pretty good at sort of just reading the vibe that I get from partner that I'm working with and kind of know where to amp up and, and ram down. I can definitely see when I'm ramping too hard and I like, can see in the eyes, like, okay, this, this, is, on, <laughs> this is a space man. He's kind of, so so uh, learning how to pull back and so puro has been a fantastic way to get me there as well. I think that in terms of Tonga Puro specifically, you and I had caught up at Charles's, the last Faretapiri, he'd run out in Hauraki there. And then not long after that, wouldn't have been too far after that, we had that, Tonga Pool or Wananga down in Wanganui when we got flooded in, which happened to be just amazing. That one pretty much just soaked it for me. Like, dude, this is just so built in. <laughs> I'm kind of already doing this stuff without even knowing it, but to be able to actually focus and utilize Tonga Pool from that Wananga on, I realized how I could integrate it seamlessly into the Takoro space, not only to temper me, but also I found little tricks and other ways I can use it to temper kids as well. <laughs> Kilda. Within the corridor that you were saying, one of the beautiful things that I can hear from your corridor bro is the foundations of our culture is really the pillars of the journey that you seem to be on and the po toko manawa and the po that are lifting your whare or that are holding the foundations of your whare down, you know, are the corridor of our kui koroma, are the foundations of our reo. I uh, know, ko te rere o te reo Māori, ngā tikanga, i ahu mai ngā kōrero i hea, or the stories. And when you look at it, for some of our people in our culture, and not just our culture, but all cultures, you know, you're always going to have those ones that love those. I call them my kaitiaki. Everywhere I go, I call them, like you have your three kaitiaki. One's called Hototu, one's called Nanakia, and one's called <laughs> Rawekeweke. You know, and they are our kaitiaki to allow us to explore, to navigate new grounds and to go go beyond what you can see, what you can hear. And I can definitely see in you that the round that you continue to not only strive in, but to show example of for all of our, not only our next generation or our rangatahi or our tamariki through education of the mahi tākoro that you do, of the uh, the taonga tākoro that you do, uh, of the taonga pūro that you do, but showing that connectivity and the whakawhanaungatanga that holds, like our 
our whare tupuna, the tukutuku, the binding threads that hold the stories of our pofakairo intact. And as you were saying, I remember meeting many moons ago, I think back in the 90s, you know, and the first time I met you was through our te reo Māori and uplifting our rangatahi. And then to find out that the kaupapa that we were both doing was in and around the whare tāpere and the kaupapa that Charles Royal was doing, that a lot of people, Hako Brown and all of them were doing, but it was finding those connectors showing not alternative ways of education for our people because we know a lot of our tamariki were being sort of like filtered into, as you were saying, you know, ADHD, but all it was was actually, well, we just have a different way of learning and and a different way of learning and a different way of showing and expressing to show they're not not listening. It's just that finding a way for those tamariki, for those rangatahi, for those people in our culture, that we are kinesthetic people and that we learn hands-on. And through that, we came across, as you're saying, the whare tāpere, the performance house. And through the whare tāpere, we have tākoro, we have pūro, we have karetao, we have a whole range of stuff that held close. And in your practices in the whare tākoro, in your practices in the whare tāpere, the whare karioi that you've taken not only around the motu, but around the world, how do you use the taonga pūoro and the practices that you do in your mahi? I think that's what I love about the whole being in the tākoro space is really like what you just mentioned around the hōtutu, the nanakia and the rawiki wiki. You're safe to explore those things and you don't have to worry about being, I went to the whare wānang and I got, all the, I got all the seven houses of learning and blah, blah, blah. You can actually just start with, because every one of us got a taonga inside of us. And if we feel safe within ourselves, if you don't, I mean, if you don't feel safe within yourself to explore your nanaki, then you're not being what our tūpuna ex- are what need of, need of us to be, which is to explore those spaces. Because as I've been working over the years, I discovered like the kuruhuna that are inside the games and the way that they trick, trick out or just kumia ka humumumai te ngā pūkenga, ngā wāna, ngā nohana, nohuna, ngā ruti te tangata. Ne? So if you're going to pull that out of them, like, you've got no chance of doing that if I keep putting barriers up myself about who can come into my space. But if I can explore it, and music does exactly the same thing, tonga puro and the art, it's your way to take any koro you have, any small amount of knowledge you have, expand it to your limitations, which actually can be quite big, <laughs> and most of the time is, and then I might then bump into somebody who was taken through the whare one and was like, there's stuff I'm just tittering around with, and I'll sit with some of the, the komato and they go, wow. <laughs> and I'm like, hey, I'm just tutoring around with that thought. But then they can add some of their deeper knowledge to it. And then I now understand, oh, hang on, I understood it on levels, but now Matua's opened the door or Fire's opened the door to me understanding it in a more tuturu way. You know what I mean? But because I'm just playing with it and I feel comfortable with being in that space, and I definitely try to that's my intent everywhere I go to when I'm engaged with whānau, to get them to feel free to just drop all their little headers and go for it as well, which can be tricky to hold all together because I think I think I agree with, I think it was Rangi Mātāmua, said one of the biggest colonising tools they did was time, te wā, because we had our tōna wā. So I didn't have to, by the end of year eight, know all the knowledge that's supposed to be in my kete at year eight because I might not actually fulfil those ones until I'm in year 13. But, in my realm and where my talents thrive, I could very well be university level. Well, I guarantee you, I was university level play up <laughs> <laughs> way back in the day. But then as time goes by, like I'm getting older now and it's only now I'm, I am actually able to still myself, to start slowing myself down <laughs> and understanding the value of doing that. But it's taken me like I'm in my late 40s now. So if I didn't lose that ahua about myself all these years, why do I expect any kid <laughs> so yeah. another wurumu that's standing in front of me. I've got to give him the mana of if this fellow takes him till he's in his 30s to, <laughs> to, to figure out, hang on, I need to chill out or do this. And that's his life journey. And that's his space. And so I think a lot of those time restrictions that we put on ourselves, like they were definitely there. Like when, when I was growing up, just in the Mariah stuff, dad had a one minute, one second, one lesson. And then, <laughs> hey boy, watch this, do it. <laughs> that's my dad's time frame. My papa, boy. Do this. Oh, you one of those slow followers. <laughs> <laughs> Three years down the line, you've hit me with the same lesson. And go, oh, yeah, he's made it past that one now. And then um, add some more to my kit there as it's going. Partake used to talk about the manatangata continuum of no and tapu. And if you apply 
that we're going through law on top of constantly (laughs) throughout our life. And it happens cyclically over and over and over again. You're never, ever going to make it. You can never be completely top of it. You can never be completely normal, but you're going to be in different aspects of that. And I think that's a great metaphor we can lay over learning as well in terms of how we take on our our different wānanga as we're progressing Mm. through life. Like all the gangsters that I, in terms of play, like the kids are the masters of play, but the absolute gangsters that I just they drop my jaw, they're all queer and they're all co <laughs> Tika tai, bro. <laughs> I remember playing <laughs> hippy toy toy with the Komata and Kuya and Motikiore at the Marae there. And Kia oh ora. my gosh, they were walking around the whare telling the rangatahi, ah, anei te tahi o ngā tākoro o ngā tūpuna. <laughs> and they were moving around the whare. As soon as you put the toko toko down and the Kuya got up, had a bit of a stretch and begun, oh my gosh, they jumped out of their tinana and it was like they became rangatahi during that particular game. Yep. And so it really brings... I call it the whakatinana tanga or really brings the, the physical connection of the realm of our whare tāpere, our whare karioi into the spectrum of exactly what you were saying is you could be a 15-year-old kōtiro, but you are matatau in your years of mātauranga that was taught to you since you were a pepe from your kuia karaua. And yet in the world of Western ideologies, you're only a year 10 or year 11, whatever the year in terms of schooling age you are. But in terms of a kaupapa or tikanga ahurea from our cultural perspective, you would be classed as hetangata matatau i rotu i taua kaupapa. And for Homanu Collective, our whānau, our Homanu whānau around the motu, one of our driving kaupapa that we look at and our vision that we have in this opportunity we've been given as te whānau or Homanu is we go by the whakatauki, Ko te piko o te mahuri, kuia te tipu o te rākau. And that's the first part of our whakatauke or our vision in terms, and that's exactly what you've been talking about, bro. And whether you are a five-year-old or a 50-year-old, just like at the whare tāpere that you were talking about earlier, at that particular one where you brought a few new tākoro to show all the whānau at that particular gathering in Kaiawa, we were able to see. And, and I remember when we set up the game Mu Torere, at that particular whare tāpere, you know, we created a circle around the papa and it was the people that we were playing toka versus rākau. And <laughs> we had tamariki that were like six, seven, eight years old playing their komatsu, a queer who were 50 plus, 60 plus. And the laughter and exchange of ngao, of ihirangaranga, of Kia aroha ora. that was floating in those spaces and the real waiata in the kata, in the laughter, in the tangi, and in the pūrāko that was being created, exactly. resonated, yep. that very whakatauki. And part of our vision, we have a second part of our whakatauki that says, he rito tangata, he mauri oro, he mauri reo, he mauri ora. And it resonates for me in the kōrero that you're talking about. And through that particular whakatauki that we have as a whānau, haumanu, are there any particular, you know, kinga or, or whakatauki or even sayings that have helped guide you in your journey through ngā mahi taonga pūro, ngā mahi tākoro that interconnects all your hōtutu <laughs> in ah, your journey. Ah, 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 yeah. And that, yeah, and that came directly from that whare tāpere with Charles. And kia kawea tātou e te rerehia, e te hariko, ah, e te mataraharaha. Because if we're being carried away in our pursuits of pleasure and joy, then our true self is going to come out. So you know, when, uh, when I took part with, with Toing Apui last year, they said, oh, I'm an artist. I paint smiles on faces. And I've seen a couple of followers in, in my little sick of like little smirks on their faces. Like, <laughs> and I was like, well, you think it's easy, bro. Stand in front of 180 kids and make them smile and love you <laughs> from the moment you stand to the moment you leave. It's not easy. It's a skill. It's an actual skill. And not everybody can do it. And to be able to weave them in and then know where to turn my energy off so that they can have this and to have all that laughter and all that sharing. But with it also comes all this wānanga. And one of the things I always teach when I do workshops is observation is absolute key. To create the space for whanaungatanga, but observing how they're receiving it, and then when gems come up, knowing when to get out of the way. 
I had a, I had a little acronym for it. Like when you get to a certain level, then <laughs> just get the F out of the way. Like at, at some point <laughs> you're going to create, you're going to allow, just like within Tonga Puro, this is what I love about Mataranga Māori because all of our whakatauki and all of our knowledge systems, they're all going to come back to the same place. They come from one source. And so as it's dribbling down to us, although we might be in a different field, it still works the same. You can apply the same whakatauki within all our different arts and crafts. And then for me, those spaces, having kids laugh, or particularly my favorite is actually when you're jamming with Fano and you've got the adults and the babies laughing at the same time, because there's a puro there that's as pure as pure can be. It's as pure as just breath into the most amazingly carved putorero with a master just to get Fano to play and have fun together in the same space and have that auto bounce. It's the same for me. It does exactly the same to me because in it I can go back. It creates this portal so where you can either come back to your youth, go back to your childhood, or even as a kid, transport them into the mind and the space of an elder. Case in point, when I'm with my moko, my moko can blow my goddamn mind. Still hasn't got words formed together yet. But her growth and her learning and, and her spouts, I was having a conversation with her on Messenger. And while we're having the conversation, she clicks, Papa, you come pick up Hura? Yeah, Papa, you pick up Hura? And I said, yes, Papa, Papa, pick up Hura. When? <laughs> and so she had clicked, hey, I've just figured out how to tell my Papa <laughs> how to come and get me. And then when you're going to come, I said, two weeks. Then she yells out to my mom, Papa, pick up Hura, two weeks. Yeah. And then, of course, for the next five minutes, nothing but Papa, pick up Hura. Hey, Papa, you pick up Hura. She's taking <laughs> that auto, that new learning, and she's vibrating it for herself. And of course, every time she says it, all of us, either side of either phone, we're all just laughing our heads off. And like, just, and now I know I'm locked. I'm going to pick her up in two weeks, whether I like it or not. Otherwise, I'm going to get a, <laughs> 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 I'm going to, I'm going to get a whole different world brought to me. So when I say that's what I mean, how natural pool will come into those spaces, because it actually is just that. And sometimes, just like our purutiti or our, or our hui or our nguru, it's those quiet voices that you actually have to listen intently for. That's what's happening in those little silence spaces. Like I saw the penny drop for her in her eyes. She had just clicked. I've just figured out how to tell Papa to come and get me. <laughs> mm. And then she repeated it over and over again, just like we would when you finally get the sound out of that kōwowo. <laughs> you never want to remove the kōwowo from your mouth again. You've found the magic spot. <laughs> hey, right, like we've seen that a million times. <laughs> they found the spot and they literally freeze their hands like, oh, nothing moves, nothing moves. Nothing moves because <laughs> they know they take it away and come back, then they might have to search for it again. And then, of course, until they're comfortable enough, they know I pick it up, I put it here, and the sound's going to come out. So that's how I like it, even within my mahi, how simple it is. Obviously, there's rhythms within the takaro. Definitely all of our games were accompanied with pao and waiata and haka and all these things. That, that's still a space we still need to work back towards. I see we're kind of compartmentalizing our different stuff as well. Like, oh, you, the haka, that's for kapa haka cruise. <laughs> when in reality it should be part of you just standing in the, you know, you can be part of your everyday jibes with your bros and then just for split second chuck our whakatoki in, in a funky new way, but you're actually bringing back the ties to, you know, dropping a chuck just freestyling that stuff into your corridor. You're utilizing the same thing, but you're bringing it, like I said, through that portal into the now which is the most important time, not, rather than getting hooked up on what we've lost or what we're trying to get back from the past. Um, yeah. At the end of the day, if we don't bring it to right here, right now, and um, Takuro kind of does that, like I said, all the time. You know, I've got a couple of drums from Tahiti, and of course they've got different tones. So I'll tell the kids, oh, this is Tane, this is Wahine, Tane, Wahine. After a while, they get to hear the different sounds, and you start to turn away when I hit Tane, this something's going to happen when I hit Wahine. Another thing is going to happen, and you know, all of a sudden, you're bringing that into that space. You know, same thing with Papaki Dede and uh, Hippie Toi Toi and Tama, Hei Tama Tu Tama, Mate, all those different games where they're bringing them all into the same space. So, even just a clapping of hands as we're conversing and rhythms and the rhythms and flows. You know, you can tell how Kamato, the guns, when they speak, there's a rhythm and a flow. I remember when I um, decided to pursue Te Reo. Because I went from not speaking it at all. And within six months, I'm pretty much <laughs> having fluent conversations. And the teacher's like, wow, how did that happen? I said, oh, I just remember when I was a kid, when you're talking, because she was an Ate Paro, so I couldn't follow her sometimes. Mm, and some of the tiny tutors there, 
But then one night I was at home doing some homework with Tito Alorupao. And then I had written some kupu down. And when I was looking at it, I heard my grandfather's voice. And then I remembered his flow. And once I locked on to his flow, to his reel, and I started reading it that way, it all just, like, the light just turned on. <laughs> and then all of a sudden I remember I understood things that I didn't remember I understood. But it was actually through the flow of the reel, the sound itself. It wasn't just learning kupu or what they meant or stuff. When they would talk, I would say to myself, oh, no, nah, that's not how it would flow. My papa was, it was quicker. <laughs> he didn't have all those E's and keys. I remember that. <laughs> they didn't have all those punctuation points. But he did within the way he flowed. And then, of course, like Mato Wakahui, yeah? he spoke the same way as my papa, but he sang a completely different way. He had his own voice, his own rhythms. And so even though they're saying the same thing, the whole wairu of what they're saying would be different because like it carried the mana of their voice, their internal voice. Like you see, but within play, I kind of just see that stuff happening all the time yeah. and just become attuned to the different spaces that are affecting it. Now, bro, one of the key elements that I heard in your corridor is actually leads on to a question that you've somewhat already answered in a way. And in terms of looking for, you know, we're in the year 2022. Taonga Puro was really revitalized or the push for Taonga Puro, the growth of it really happened in the late 70s and early 80s when you had the Hidden New Melbournes, the Richard Nunzes, the Joe Malcolms, the Bruce Gregories, and all of those names starting to pop up all around the motu, both Māori and non-Māori, coming through with this revitalization of Taonga Puro. And not only around at that time, that was the whole revitalization of our reo. And the differences of our reo, like you just spoke about, you know, the differences between when you hear a Ngāti Parau person speaking to that of a Ngāpuhi, to that of a Waikato. And so we're learning, even like we're 50 years later from the 1970s now, um, learning the, the dialectual differences between our iwi. And now in 2022, you go back to the 80s even, and Auntie Nada Glavish got in trouble for just saying <laughs> kia ora in the telecommunications, and that created an uproar, whereas now 2022, no matter what channel you're flicking in mainstream New Zealand now, you're actually hearing news presenters, you're hearing hosts of particular radio shows and everybody's properly starting to, not everybody is doing it, but there's more of an attempt to actually say our kupu correctly, you know, say te reo Māori correctly. In terms of our taonga puoro and the practice of taonga puoro, I heard you earlier saying that that's one of the things that this world that we're living in has compartmentalised our differences. Like, it's different mahi when you're talking about ngā taonga tākoro and taonga puoro and kare tau and all these other areas that in a Western viewpoint are different arts practices. But when you come from the realm of the whare tapere, when you come from the realm of a cultural perspective, everything's all interwoven and integrated with one another. And so in terms of those aspirations that you were talking about, in finding and reconnecting to not have any barriers, as you were talking about earlier, we need to actually push those barriers out of the way in terms of takoro. We need to let our tamariki, our taonga puro practitioners or people that are wanting to actually pick up their first kōwowo and swing their first pūrerehua and learn about those taonga puro in a way that they are open to do and in a way that they can can play that pūrerehua whilst tākoro is being played, but which pūoro do is played during those times and we're in an interesting time at the moment where we are starting that exploration and as you said, bro, when people are playing, whether it's heitama tūtama or whether it's uh, papakirere, what waiata were played, what pao were played and where the instruments being played and how can we explore that and so if you had a group of people that came to a wānanga and that already started their journey of Taonga Pūoro or starting their journey of Taonga Pūoro, what types of connectors would you share with them for them to explore and for them to open up their world of learning with Taonga Pūoro? Yeah, the, 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 my go-to my go to tākoro for that space is kite, and, and kite is normally played in, in, in groups, but it can happen just somebody blindfolded amongst the group 
as you travel a pathway, you're going to set up a little obstacle course in the room and you're going to navigate them from one space to another, often collecting something on the way and taking it to another space within the room, but you're not allowed to use words in order to instruct them how to get there. And Tonga Poodle, especially um, because it works even at the beginner level, because, for instance, one kid might just be able to get the cool way to go, and that's all, but that's enough to give an instruction. (laughs) <laughs> then, of course, everybody can play the court. <laughs> everybody can get the court. Everybody can play kopaki. I think that particular taco takes away that you have to master this instrument or figure out how to play it and be able to do the things that you can do with a putorino, which seems like far off, but inside the context of their game, it allows them to say, nah, dude, if you can get any sound out of it. <laughs> no, if you can just get your putorino and just tapping the mouthpiece, you know, and then get that whoop, whoop, and get the water drop sounds coming out of it. Mm. And so, yeah, I have those. There are lots of taco that do that. Um, something like poi rako, we're passing the rako around rhythmically. But then, of course, air popper. As you're singing with air popper, it gives everybody a cadence, a rhythm to move with, and therefore they can control what's happening because it's actually quite dynamic game, especially mm. if I try to get them up to five rako as fast as possible. <laughs> 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 which I normally do after they get three round ones. So, yep, you're ready, bro. <laughs> but just having everybody understanding how music and rhythm can put us all into that circadian rhythm where we all ebb and flowing in the same space, but there's also a safety that comes with that space in terms of learning new skills. So I'll often start with Kite because, like I said, they don't need to get experts at it real quick, but it's enough for them to get a sound out of it. And then they'll come back because I'll leave my kete with all my puro will be just laid out like they are behind me right now. Because like I said, sometimes it's the pressure of being in front of people. Sometimes it's the pressure of that moment. And so all they need for you is to leave the room. <laughs> so then they're alone with the Rakatogi. And then all of a sudden they'll give it a go. And they might make just the slightest breath into it the right way. And uh, my favorite, like I said, is those quiet sounds that where it's just you and the instrument or the ha ora and the real, the real atua, the real uh, actual instrument, because that's when you see the little spark in the eyes. So it's straight up like, yes, I made a first sound. <laughs> I made my Elder. first sound on it. And, and I think like kite and things like that, it's a great way of you introducing them to that space. And then, of course, because the blind file dude tends to walk around and fall and <laughs> there's some, some innate great fun and a group of people who can see... <laughs> <laughs> something that's so simple, but somebody who's blindfolded or had a sense taken from them and trying to function with a new real. I'm taking instructions from a space that's not normal for them to take instruction from a purutiti. Like that's actually a strange thing to try and explain to somebody. Yeah. <laughs> but when within the play space, within that realm, that knowledge transfer is much easier. And like I said, because you're in that play space, you can mess it up and everybody laughs. Yeah, <laughs> and they're like, even the fellows who are cracking up, laughing at one dude, but all of a sudden, once they're in the middle of the floor and they're blindfolded, <laughs> there's a complete flip of energy. You know, the energy transfers from the guy who felt like an idiot, <laughs> like flopping around in the dark, now gets to watch somebody else go through it. Yeah. Like I said, there's just an innate sense of learning in that space that makes it much safer. At that last hui we did with Taipa and Kelly and them over in Haititai, in, in Ngatikaite, there was one particular boy who one night it took him, bro, he was there for three days and he resisted that whole time. <laughs> and then I was real glad because Pryor was there and he snuck on over to me in a quiet moment and said, what's what that quarter did he drop last night? Can you explain that to me again? Which told me that he was listening intently, but in the moment when it was happening, oh, I don't know, this is dumb stuff. Oh, he, he had that ahu about him. But really, it hit him. He just felt exposed. But in the quieter space, he snuck up to me, and we ended up having a really deep wānong on it for like 30, 45 minutes. And she came over and goes, oh, my God, he took in everything you said. I said, yeah. But he wasn't like in a normal setting within the pressure of a school or time frame. He's not allowed to let me know that he actually got something from it. But because we were on the marae and inside that mouldy time frame, that was the moment it took three days for him to, to feel comfortable, comfortable yes. yeah, to actually come and ask yeah, right. about something that he had experienced. And that's never going to happen in the school environment for him. It's just not going to happen because of that. And that's not the schools not blaming schools or nothing. That's just the time frame that working within those spaces. 
So yes, it just allows things to happen organically, more natural, and including the part where I don't want to participate right here, right now. <laughs> like Cultural right safety. now, right now is not the time for me to do that much. But then, then when he picked the time, it was me. Then there was <laughs> I was meant to go and report or ring somebody up, but I know they just have to go on hold. This young man found a connection, and now you've connected with it, and so we're able to do that within that space. He felt safe. That's right in the environment. And he felt the trust that had been built and was able to create that communication. It leads me on to this final question in terms of that exact point, bro, of whether the new players are rangatahi, a taiohi, or whether the person is already a matua, a fire, a kuia, kuraua. For all of our whānau that are listening and those that are wanting to start their journey with Taonga Pūoro and start their journey in connecting with Taonga Pūoro, what advice would you give them to help them along in their hiding and their journey? It's like that dude, Leah, just, just do it. Like, <laughs> <laughs> just do it. Don't wait to become an expert. Like, I think the first one I said in when we did that series with by Hiri uh, Wirangi, because she did her, uh, the first time of Puru is your voice. And that was a massive learning for me. I was like, yeah, of course, all of us can whistle. All of us can. That is definitely one and one that we actually pretty okay with because we can all do a little while to talk to everyone if they're just, I mean, in our R's and L's and in the background, the safety of that space. Rhythmic things, like I said, the Kohatu, the Rako is just tapping and clapping and holding rhythms. That's another safe way in. Because of the nature of Puru to be able to heal and to open multiple portals, really, because, you know, I said with the Putorino Wararomirumi session was going on, and just that sound helped for some of our whanau to simply release, just hearing it, oh, never heard that <laughs> sound before, but that's enough for them to shut down some of the things that they were using, not wanting to face some of the mama that was sitting in them, but hearing the Putorino or hearing some of these sounds that really just haven't been heard for a long time because the wairua <laughs> definitely knows those sounds because it's the sound of nature, the sound of the universe pretty much as it comes through and all the different the different uh, honga. And so because of that, I think it's just about trusting in yourself and understanding that we don't have to master it or become the master of it, just getting a sound out of it, out of any of the tonga. Sitting with it, definitely, obviously, as all of our go-to, sitting in nature and understanding that it's already there, that you <laughs> that, that you already understand it. And then really, when they hear bubbling water come from Morocco, I love watching the kids go, what the heck? <laughs> that actually sounds like water. <laughs> and then how does a stick make that sound? And how does stones make swirling synth sounds, synthesizer sounds? Because, you know, mm-hmm. if you get the right core out there, rub the right ones together, <laughs> you can get brushing water pads and stuff like that and letting them see those things. You know, that we've all done to listen to the shell. And then, oh, hang on, a whole ocean sits inside me. <laughs> no matter where you go, the voice of the ocean carries with it. And so, yeah, really just encouraging them that it's not beyond you. If you can whistle, you can play any of our flutes. <laughs> and it's just about really trying to break down any barrier that they might have that they don't know enough. I think, like, we're pretty hard on ourselves in Taumori. I mean, we're our biggest critics. <laughs> with our, with our, our whānau on their real journey. And, of course, they're going to get it wrong. That's how that works. You're relearning your voice you're, and you're more importantly learning to be comfortable with your voice. And I think just encouraging them to understand that you have one, we've all got one, and we've all got something that we can offer to another space. I remember with a group of year ones and I was explaining to them, oh, actually it was one of the local kura kopo, but I had taken my kit in because I let them know we're going to do Tonga Pūro. And of course it sat me down and I'm playing them through the different whānau, Tonga Roa and Tāwhiri and whatnot. And you can see they're bouncing off the walls. And then one of them said, I want to, I want to do it, I want to do it. And I said, oh, but God made sure to finish with the hui because I could see that the energy was a little bit too wild. <laughs> 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 and they were going to probably wreck some of my gear. <laughs> but once I talked to them about hene pute hui, in that space, I said, I can't let you just blow wildly on it. I need you to put yourself. And then they went and sat in the corner. Breathe deep and <laughs> sleep. So, so Chris, like, am I tall enough now? I don't know, are you? <laughs> and then, of course, they had tempered themselves. So, like I said, they're not just running wild on the gear because I definitely, like, open my, my tongue up for everybody to experience. But 
at the same time, we've got to protect the taonga as well. And if they're not bringing the right energy to that space, if um, if we can teach that to young babies, it can be taught to to anyone. And cool. and of course, when they calm themselves and they they're even playing the pumuana, like trying to play it softly. <laughs> no, okay. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, that one, bro, you have to give it some guts. <laughs> <laughs> what? what? And then you can, he's going to suck some breath out of you and you won't be able to whisper to that fella. And then, of course, then they realize, hey, I got permission to let loose as well. Oh, but like I said, there was that little natural journey that our Pudako and the tongue of themselves, because they can see that they're delicate. It's not rocket science. Okay. But then, of course, like I said, to making sure that you're also transferring the right tikanga across all them, they're being able to do that. And so for me, yeah, it's just fun if you're comfortable to give it a go. I'm still tittering hard with it. I'm still figuring out how to move with it. I'm getting lessons from people who have never even touched it before they've ever touched it. Because sometimes the part I, that I find I have about them make me double check, hey, do I actually know that? <laughs> 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 so even without engaging Physically with it, there's a wānanga that they bring with it. If they hear a sound, like I've had lots of times where just hearing the pūkaya triggers an emotion or feeling in somebody or they had a reaction. I had a mate who went to one of Kelly's Māori Ori sessions in Whangarei and she had a reaction. She said to me at a time, hey, he played this person and this thing happened to me. And she said, well, that's the mate, that's the tonga talking to you. There's something in you talking with the tonga and like revisit. Like, if anything, if he, if that happened weeks ago and here it's still sitting with you, then revisit the space. And I think a lot of our arts people can be intimidated by the James Whispers and the Hormon Horals of the world who can make them do ballet dances and, <laughs> and do backflips <laughs> on these things and forgetting that at one stage you were stumbling, at one stage you were whistling and the whistle turned into the sound and then because of the natural connection and the aroha that's already there resonates within you and that pool of whānau, you're able to take it to all the spaces you're able to take it to. And if you can do it and I can do it with Takaro and flip my life upside down and thrive in it, then obviously it works for everyone. It's just about what is the one that's going to get you through the door. Hey, that's it, man. Just get involved in it. Don't give yourself too much of a hard time with it. Stay with that chakawa tātou tere here. Tāre koutu matarahara. If we kind of move with our spaces into there. And then when you get a few... Not just on you and you <laughs> and you've got some stuff or then you can sit down and have the deeper wānanga with the, the <laughs> fellas and I think you'll be quietly surprised that deeper wānanga is the same as a little baby <laughs> tripping over <laughs> tripping over a subject or asking a question because I'd seen it in Paparidi and them all different even Matua knowing them when, yeah, well. when I ask a question that's on the outside of their current understanding like they've got enough experience where they can chip for half a second and then do a backflip and land on their feet yeah. <laughs> and then pull you back into that space. But that's because they've had the time to sit with their, their tūpuna and their tūpuna knowledge systems over a period of time. Yeah. And then, of Talk course, so they feel comfortable. They feel comfortable with their understanding of that space and so able to share. And then I think it's real important for our whānau to understand that's how it works for the tohungas and that's how it works for the babies coming into the space here. They're not too far apart, in, in, in all honesty. <laughs> tika, tika tau. And in saying that, eh, hoa, kua rere te wā. Uh, kua rere te wā, anō nei tērā kōrero a tōna wā, e rā o ngā āhuatanga, being constricted by time, but at the same time, allowing us to know that the learning never stops between the 10-minute mark, the one-hour mark, the three years of a bachelor's degree mark, or the however learning we learn in different spaces. When it comes to our kaupapa, you know, it takes a lifetime and many lifetimes of learning for us to uh, not just scratch the surface, but to dive deep into the realms of any of our old whare wānanga, like our whare tāpere and our mahi with taonga pūro. And I really love the kōre in terms of the whare tāpere and kia kawe tātou e te rehia, e te harikua, e te mataharahara. That particular saying is actually a great way of actually letting our whānau know. Because can you say that ki ngā nō, bro? Kia kawe tātou e te rehia, e te hariko, e te mataharahara. mataharahara. And us all be carried away in the pursuits of joy and happiness. And the mataharahara is a pro term for with your with your heart, your heart and your mind wide open. Right? Yeah. So allowing things to flow in and out of your space. 
I picked that up, like I said, at that first party party that I came with with Charles. And that was before I got my van. You know, my old van I rolled around with, all, with half our village with half our folk and our inside of it. Kia and so when I got the van, I immediately named it, his, his name is Kawe. Tontonengone ko Kawe, as in just short for Kia Kawea. Kia Kawea tātou e te rehi a te hariko, te mataraharaha. So when my van rolls up, kids that know Papa Wurumuk, they know damn well, they can't wait to see what's in it. <laughs> no, I've never sought of volunteers to come and help me bring the gear out on the field. But that's because, like I said, it's how I, um, that's how profound that quarter door kind of hit me. And it suited perfect to a T what I was trying to achieve anyway, because I don't have an outcome, so to speak, other than opening up whoever it is I'm able to share space with. And so, yep, definitely set me well over the years and sums up perfectly for me how I try to approach things uh, within Takuru, within Puro, within everything to do Tao Māori. It's like I said, it keeps things. Letting us know that no space is fine because in that no space, we actually free. Remember, no is without restriction. Right. right. And then as we understand ourselves, we bring the top in to make sure that we don't go now, um, take it into spaces it doesn't belong. But that top happens over time and the no can happen right now. But you can go from no to top real quick because when you have a profound moment, which happens a lot with the water, it happens a lot with top or just with engagement and tell Maori. Period. And then, of course, that door is wide open for everybody to go and shake the tree that our, our tupuna left for us and catch their fruit. <laughs> so, ka pai e te whanau, uh, koutou e whakarongo mai ana ki tēnei o ngā whiti whiti kōrero. So to all the whanau that are out there that are listening to this, you know, a wonderful example that our hoa, te tuakana nei, our Wurumu Sarich has shared with us in this whiti whiti kōrero. A lot of our mahi that comes from our tupuna, that comes from our kete mā tauranga, from mā tauranga Māori, everything is interconnected and especially when you're dealing with our kaupapa that we come from in our foundation of our te reo Māori and the love of ngā taonga tākoro, ngā taonga pūro and all the other mahi, the pūrāko that comes with all of these things are all interrelated or interconnected. Whether you are five years old or 70 years old, these are those spaces that we can interconnect and interweave as whānau and so I really love that Fakatoki to finish off our corridor for this evening being that Kiakawea Tato Eterehia Ete Harikua Ete Mataraha Raha. And so Ete Hua E Mara Teneo E Karanga Tu Kiakwe Te Mihi Nui Te Mihi Ranga Tira Kwa Noho Maikwe Hei Fiti Fiti Korero Kia Tato I Te Neiwa Nurida Me Pehia Nei Te Tukua Tu Te Mihi Tu Atu I Te O Atona Wa Tawa Nei He Wananga Ano Ki Te Tai Toke Rau Mā Te Ahara Mā Te Whakatipu I te mātau ranga mō a tātou whānau i rotu i te ao pūoro, i rotu i te ao tākaro nō rīra. He kupu whakamutunga hei whakokopani i a tātou i tēnei wā. So just in closing off, bro, uh, it's been an awesome kōrero in this Fiti Fiti kōrero. It's been amazing listening to your experiences and listening to your journey and how you connect with those that are hungry, that are matikai for the mahi of Taonga Tākoro and Taonga Pūro and its interconnectivity. And so just for our whānau, he kupu whakamutu ngā tau, he whakakopane i tēnei wā. Kaira, he la kai, he mana mā kaua wari wara tātou, te mana a tākoro nei te Te whaka hiki, te whaka piki i te ora, te whaka kotahi i te whanau, hene, he tomokanga tēnei, ka, ka, ka kaumātua atu koe, ka tamariki atu rānei, ne mā te tākura anō koe, e tuwhera ana, ne, he mā manohi o tēnei, te, te whaka tīnana i te, I, I te whaka taukine i ana, ke kawe tātou i te, I te, I te rehi, I te haruko, I te mataraha rānei. Nō rira, kawe, kawe wari wari, kawe kia atu koe ki tō, Ko kau mātua tanga muri mai. <laughs> kau tomo noa atu, ka, ka iana kau ware ware, ko kau mātua haere koe huki mai ki tō, ki tō ao. Me mea ko haka tamariki koe i a koe ano, huki mai ki tō pakeke tanga na. Uh, he mea he, he whaka nō i a koe, he whaka wāte i a koe, ane a kia whai kā koe ki te, te, te mahi i ngā mai, ki te hiki i ngā, e, 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 ngā, e, ngā pikau tanga, ko wai ho te mai e ngā tūpuna, he aratika, he oranga ora matatuka. So, yeah. Nō reire te whanau, mauri ora ki a tātou, a ko tēnei māua, ko taku hoa a Wirumu Sarich e mihi kawatu ana ki a tātou e te whanau. Mauri ora. Mauri ora. Ko te piko, te mahuri, ko ia te tipu 
Inglaterra.